We live in interesting times. Today's stories. A city described as a gas chamber. Garbage, garbage everywhere. Ghost fishing haunts the ocean floor. A blind street beggar in Nigeria becomes a star recording artist. A celebration of world cultures in Richmond, British Columbia. The salt of the earth from South Africa. There's more than hot air in these balloons. From the sports desk, the BC Lions wrap it up for the season. The Canucks outscored by St. Louis. Toronto Raptors fans remain hopeful about their championship team. And living off the land and roadkill in Florida. I'm Thomas I. Likeness with Eagle News, broadcasting from our Edmonton, Canada studio, bringing you stories from around the globe. The environment dominates this segment of our broadcast. In various parts of the world, there is pollution in the air, on the ground and underwater. We'll look at three regions. Our coverage begins with a problem that kills at least a million people a year in India, namely smog and toxic air. Now the air people are breathing in New Delhi is so bad that a top government official describes the city as a gas chamber. According to the World Health Organization, India is home to 14 of the world's 15 most polluted cities. How bad is it? Well, these images are of a typical day in New Delhi. Where does the air pollution come from? Every winter, smoke from farmers' fields combines with industrial and vehicle emissions that forms smog that envelops towns and cities across northern India. Hardest hit are unborn babies and young children. Neonatologist Sanklap Dudija says unborn children face a lifetime of problems because of the poor air quality. Not just these short-term problems, they have even long-term problems like uh, uh, risk of lower IQs in future, risk of uh, various developmental problems in future, risk of diabetes, hypertension and obesity in future. So pollution is not just affecting the uh, acute or the short-term outcomes, it is also affecting the long-term outcomes as far as newborn babies are concerned. And the lives of those children are cut short in many cases. Government research blames air pollution for killing more than 100,000 children under the age of five every year. The toxic air has prompted schools to take action to protect students. High school student Mahira Sharma fears for the future. I felt that it's already a threat to our health and it's going to get worse in future. Another student, Omanchi, says activities are restricted. Uh, like we had the days off, after we came to school, we were not allowed to go outside much and play, which is a good thing. And the kids were not allowed to play as well. And right now, they're just going out when the weather is nice. Other than that, they're not really allowed outside. Omanchi says schools are teaching children how to cope with toxic air. And then we also have like an assembly every morning and we keep getting reminders of uh, how bad the situation is and what we should do. And those are the measures our school is taking at the moment. With no respite in sight, all doctors can recommend are face masks and expensive air purifiers at home. That is, if people can afford them, which many cannot. We now travel to the southern end of the Arabian Peninsula in Western Asia, to the Republic of Yemen. The historic city of Taiz was once considered one of the most beautiful places in that country, but you wouldn't know it now. Mounds of stinking garbage line the streets of Taiz, which has been torn apart by war. While all of Yemen has suffered from the war, Taiz is particularly hard hit. Barely any schools are open, fresh water is scarce, and it's difficult to bring in supplies, including essentials like food. More than 600,000 people live in Taiz. They're trapped within the city limits, 
as garbage piles up, choking roads and canals. Brightly colored plastic, old tires, boxes, and shredded plastic lie in smoldering piles or heaped in dumpsters. A far cry from the days as far back as medieval times when Thais was lauded for its beauty. And the trash is a breeding ground for disease, especially cholera. Cholera can kill within hours if left untreated. Staff at the shabby and ill-equipped hospitals that are still functional amid the continued violence are at their wit's end. They're unable to cope with the rising number of patients. Cholera reappeared in Yemen in April after an initial outbreak in October 2016. The World Health Organization says in the past couple of years, more than 300 people died of the disease in Thais, with cases fluctuating week to week. The beleaguered head of Thais's Department of Sanitation says civil servants are doing their best to clean the city. He says the department is working two shifts, one in the morning and one in the evening, but the garbage keeps piling up and the department lacks tools and resources. Trash is also piling up on the floor of the world's oceans. Abandoned and lost fishing gear is one of the problems. An organization called Ghost Fishing is doing something about it. Ghost Fishing was founded by Pascal Van Erp. He's a diver. He says nets, lines, cages, crayfish traps, and gill nets are either lost or intentionally dumped in the ocean at an estimated rate of one ton per minute. And Van Erp says this junk just doesn't lie harmlessly at the bottom of the sea while marine life swims by. When fishing gear is lost in the oceans without human uh, involvement, it keeps on continuous fishery. So actually it's a sort of circle of death we always name it because the, the fish is getting catched by the net or by the lines. It dies, it attracts other animals. They also die in the same net or in the lines or in the hooks. So it's continuously, continuously, continuously going. It's just a waste of fish. And that's where the term ghost fishing comes from, because that discarded gear is still catching fish. Thilo Mack, the ocean expert for Greenpeace, says this stuff is all over the place. I mean, we are a thousand miles off the coast of South Africa and finding abandoned fishing gear here, like these traps that we, that we found, um, is extremely disgusting. Because um, in, in such a remote place, to find it just shows that fishing is everywhere. The United Nations estimates that 640,000 tons of fishing equipment is discarded around the oceans each year. Now that's the weight equivalent of 50,000 double-decker buses. An inspiring story now about someone who made it off the polluted streets. From street beggar in Nigeria to popular recording artist, here is the tale of Yahaya Makaho. Now, life hasn't been easy for the 37-year-old man. You see, at the age of three, he got measles, and the disease robbed him of his sight. After doctors failed to heal him, Makaho was eventually sent away from his rural village to an Islamic school. There, he was told that begging was his best chance to make ends meet after he tried his hands at small odd jobs and petty trading. Makaho says it hurt him to always ask people for money, adding that begging kills the spirit. Music became his ticket to getting off the streets. He says he wanted to do something meaningful with his life, and the idea of being a singer just popped into his head. But stardom was neither easy nor instant. Bacajo faced years of discrimination and discouragement before a wealthy fan decided to fund a recording session in 2016. Since then, the singer has carved out a niche by focusing on the pressing problems that confront his fans in their daily lives. With his soft voice, he croons his way through lyrics that tackle such ills as begging, drug abuse, and corruption. In the last four years, his songs and music videos have become hits among the roughly 80 million Hausa-speaking Nigerians and broader West Africa. Bakaho says he has punctured the stereotype that people have, that once you're blind, all you can do is take a bowl and go begging for alms on the streets. Life can be tough in Nigeria, where poverty rates and unemployment are high, and for blind people, the options are usually severely limited.
Still to come, one of our correspondents traveled the world without leaving the city. Top chefs like this salt from South Africa, celebrating the end of the rainy season in Myanmar. This is Eagle News. You're watching Eagle News. In Richmond, BC, Eagle News correspondent Kathleen Cruz toured the world, but as she tells us in this report, she never even left the city. On its fifth year of celebrating significant cultural diversity, this year's 2019 Richmond World Festival has done it again. The two-day free family event has attracted over thousands of attendees, offering a jam-packed celebration of music, food, culture, and sports. It just allows people to come and experience different cultures in terms of, you know, dance or music and arts, and then the food aspect. You could try different foods from around the world. Um, it also allows people just to interact and talk to each other and learn a little bit more about each other's um, uh, background. In terms of tourism, we definitely have a regional draw and people definitely come uh, from outside of Richmond and beyond, uh, specifically for the festival. This international event highlights the cultural harmony and inclusiveness in Richmond. We have a large uh, sort of uh, exhibitor and cultural pavilion uh, zone. Uh, we have uh, pavilions from Russia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, Japan, and Africa that are well represented. Uh, you could experience, you know, different artisans and uh, henna painters, a lot of great things. Uh, we have over 60 food trucks um, here this year. We have a culinary stage where we have chefs doing cooking demonstrations. And you get to sample the food after. And then, of course, uh, it's really about uh, music. And with over 130 performers over the two days on eight stages. The showcase of culture is well represented in the event as seen in a variety of food trucks serving international flavors from European to Middle Eastern to Asian. Who would forget the classic fair foods such as poutine, corn dogs, hot dogs, mac and cheese, and deep-fried desserts for everybody to enjoy. Foodies are also invited to drop by at the culinary stage. Fair goers can also enjoy the Global Village and Bamboo Theater offering diverse and innovative performances from different ethnicities plus the other free activities. You can go into the Minner Arena where we have the Antarctic Zone and you can put on skates or to play boom ball and skate around and get cool. Uh, we have the Kids Zone, lots of great activities there and uh, there's lots of different crafts and cultures. From Vancouver, Canada, Kathleen Cruz, Eagle News, 1 with 25. Here's something for the salt shaker on your dining room table. It has a unique taste is said to have healing powers, oh, and is expensive. Balani salt is hand harvested from the banks of a remote river in northwestern South Africa. The salt comes from a sulfur hot spring that locals say is on sacred ground. The harvesting by tradition is done only by women. They often camp in the dry riverbed for weeks to make the most of the dry season before the spring rains fall. The salt is developing a growing culinary following. Top chefs prize it for crystals that are tiny, evenly sized and chunky, and with its own unique flavor. Jermaine Esau, the head chef at Cape Town's award-winning Mayoga restaurant, says it gives a mineral taste to anything you cook. He says it's potent, adding a little goes a long way. Bellony salt is used in numerous luxury restaurants across Cape Town and Johannesburg. It retails for more than $8 a kilo. At the Mioga, Bellany salt became the salt of choice after the restaurant decided to phase out imported products and go for local sources. In the country of Myanmar, 
People are celebrating the end of the rainy season with flames and fireworks. This celebration features huge homemade hot air balloons. They're laced with fireworks and candles. And people take this event seriously. They will spend two to three months working on their balloon design and construction. The balloons cost more than $3,000 to put together and carry up to 65 kilograms of fireworks. During the 10-day event, some 200 balloons will be launched. Some of them remain aloft for up to 40 minutes. Many of them fly close to the ground. Now, what could possibly go wrong? As revelers party on the ground, they are risking death or at least injury. Every year, several spectators are injured. The last deaths were in 2014 when three people died after a balloon crashed on them. But the dangers don't deter the spectators. The celebration attracts tens of thousands of people. One of them was German tourist Bjorn Wenninger. No way it could go down like this. It's too crazy, too unsafe, but definitely very much fun. This year, organizers are taking safety measures. The balloons will be launched from a fenced-off area instead of from in the middle of crowds. Up next in sports, a couple of losses for Vancouver sports teams. And fans hang on to hope for the Raptors. And stay around for this story. A Florida man living off the land in a big city has some interesting survival strategies. You're watching Eagle News. This is Eagle News. I'm Thomas Eilichness. From our sports desk, correspondent Anthony Sevilla tells us that players for the BC Lions have cleaned out their lockers after failing to make it into postseason play. The BC Lions and the Calgary Stampeders faced off for the final time in Week 21. With Remembrance Day fast approaching, the Lions organization hosted the Salute to Veterans game at BC Place, paying tribute to the Canadian Armed Forces. Prior to the game, the event included a marching parade and the singing of O Canada, led by the Needed Pipe Band. The halftime show was used to pay tribute and homage to the veterans and current serving members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Many D-Day veterans, cadets, scouts, members of the Royal Canadian Navy and first responders were invited as honoured guests of the evening by participating in the event festivities. The veterans and active serving members of the Canadian Forces were also treated to watch some exciting football. Oh, the game's great. The game's great. Because the, uh, well, I'm more in involved in, the, in my cadets out there tagging and getting the poppies distributed in that for the ceremonies. It's nice to see people up that really respect and understand what our veterans did. And I, I really, like myself, I don't call myself a real veteran. To me, the real veterans are the guys that went over there. I've, I've watched many BC Line games over the year, and it's always uh, good to watch them when we were out there uh, unrolling the flag at the uh, Oak Canada, the front end part of the, the football game. The players were coming around and saying great job and everything. But I, it was nice to be uh, appreciated by the players and, and the other fans in the audience. And this here uh, event at the BC Lions Calgary game is a, a good event where they're able to focus on saying thank you to members of the Canadian Forces as well as to uh, the veterans and various different uh, veteran groups that come out here to help celebrate it. And it also gives the opportunity for our uh, cadet members, uh, the Army, Navy, Air Cadets and the Navy League to come out and march in a big parade and and, uh, carry the flags and that and they really enjoy that. It's good development for the young kids. BC Lions wide receiver Brian Burnham shared his reasoning on why it was special to him being able to pay tribute to the Canadian Armed Forces. I take a lot of pride in that. Uh, 
giving respect to the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, my father was uh, in the United States Marine Corps, served a tour in Vietnam, so I have so much respect for those guys and what they do uh, in the States and Canada. It's amazing and, and I appreciate them. Unfortunately for the Lions, they were unable to end their season with a win. They fell to 5-13 and, and at the bottom of the West and will miss the postseason for the second time in three years. The Stampeders used this opportunity as a warm-up game after already punching their ticket into the CFL playoffs. The 107th Grey Cup will take place in Calgary as the defending Grey Cup champion Calgary Stampeders will look to repeat, this time in their home city. Anthony Sevilla, Eagle News, 1 with 25. A bad night for the Vancouver Canucks. Eagle News correspondent Anthony Sevilla also covered that contest. The defending Stanley Cup champion St. Louis Blues tied up the season series 1-1 after a 2-1 overtime win against the red-hot Vancouver Canucks at Rogers Arena. Despite giving up a late third period goal, the Blues took advantage of a 3-0 opportunity to close out the game in overtime. The Canucks and Blues game was opened up with a ceremonial puck drop that included Canucks captain Bo Horvat and Blues captain Alex Piacangelo. The opening ceremonial face-off was in honor of the original Vancouver Canucks alumni from the original 1970 team which was the first Canucks team to reach the playoffs in the 1975 season. The St. Louis Blues defeated a red-hot Vancouver Canucks squad who were winners of six of their last eight games. Vancouver managed to score 11 goals over the last few games, however were limited to just one against the defending Stanley Cup champions. The Canucks were denied constantly throughout the second and third period. After trailing 1-0 almost the entire game, a late game push by the Vancouver Canucks forced the game into overtime. However, a tragic end to the game came after giving up a heartbreaking 3-on-0 breakaway after all three Canucks skaters were too slow to get back up. Yeah, I made the pass and I was going towards the net and puck went by me. And Next thing I know, there's three of us in the corner, um, two of us fall down and oh, it's tough to get back in that position. Yeah, I mean, it's not. there's nothing you can do. It's just hoping it's going to hit you and... Um, no, it's it's tough to tough to give up that one. <clears throat> yeah. No, I don't think so. No, it's unfortunate, like you said. After losing the first one of three matchups between the two clubs, Vancouver have continued their hot start to the season, leading the NHL in almost every statistical category, and were even given the best odds of winning the Stanley Cup just one month into the season. The defending champs acknowledged their opponents and shared their insight about the future for this Canucks team. Yeah, I mean, they're a really good team. Uh, a lot of speed, um, you know, work the puck around well. They got a lot of skill uh, mixed with, you know, some grit and, and guys that work really hard. So, um, you know, they got a bright future. They're going to have a good year like they already are. And, um, you know, they're a really good team. It's a tough battle every time you play them. You know, they're a tough team. They're a hard team to play against. They put you on your heels a little bit with their speed and their attack. And, you know, their defense is very involved. Hughes, Hughes is a dynamic player. Uh, creates a lot of stuff in the offensive zone. they they got a good hockey team. It was, both games were tough games. After giving up the first matchup to the Canucks in a 4-3 shootout loss, the St. Louis Blues tie up the season series at one game apiece. St. Louis and Vancouver will close out the season series in the new year when they face off one last time at Rogers Arena. Anthony Sevilla, Eagle News, always won with 25. With the latest on the NBA and the Toronto Raptors, Eagle News correspondent, Agent Pangi Lenan. The defending champions enter Wednesday night's contest as the fifth best team in the Eastern Conference. With a 4-2 record, the fans are proud of the team's valiant efforts. They nearly overcame a 26-point deficit before falling short to the Milwaukee Bucks. They look to get back on the winning track as they take on a young and talented Sacramento Kings squad at home where they remain undefeated. The Raptors improved their record by overpowering the Kings with a bounce contribution from key players. Pascal Siakam scored 23 points along with 13 rebounds, Kyle Lowry had 24 points, and Serge Ibaka chipped in with 21 points off the bench. Nick Nurse commented on his team's play. 
Um, but I thought everybody was into you know what we call next action basketball tonight. When it didn't look good, boom, it was it was to Mark and to the other side and to the next screen and roll, and that didn't look good, boom, it was to the other side, and and um, you know that's that's a little bit more like it for us offensively. With the continued contributions of the young players on the roster, the team is poised to make another run to the playoffs. It will be interesting to see just how far this roster can go as the season plays out. They will face another great test now that they head out west against some familiar foes. This will be no easy task for the reigning NBA champions before they head out west for their five game road trip. They look to take on the Pelicans, Lakers, Clippers, Trailblazers before ending off in Dallas to face the Mavericks. Last season, the team won 22 out of 30 contests against Western Conference opponents, and, it'll be a t and it will take a tremendous effort to top that record. For more NBA coverage, tune in to EBCSI for more stories and highlights around the sports world. From Scotiabank Arena, I'm Adrian Pagliolini, Eagle News, 1 with 25. Have you ever heard of an urban forager? That's what Florida resident Rob Greenfield describes himself as. The 33-year-old man is living off the land. But Greenfield isn't some hermit who resides in the middle of nowhere. The American environmentalist is doing this in a major city, Orlando. He says for the past year, he hasn't spent a cent on food. How does he do it? Greenfield only eats what he can grow in his own garden or nearby gardens what he can fish for, or what he can peel off the highway. Yeah, roadkill is an option. Greenfield says he hopes to inspire others to do the same, that is, live more sustainably. So for the last year, I've been growing and foraging 100% of my food. No grocery stores, no restaurants, no beer at a bar. All of my food has either come from my garden or that I've foraged from nature, which could be going to the ocean to collect my own salt, going fishing, or collecting fruit from trees. So nature has been my garden, it's been my pantry, and it's been my pharmacy. When Greenfield pitched a tent here, he originally planned to live in this garden for only a few months. So when I moved here, this abundant garden was just a lawn like that. He gets his water from the sky. Really good. So this is rainwater, and that's what I drink when I'm in Orlando. Even his medicine and supplements are homegrown. I don't take any vitamins or supplements at all. I grow my vitamins as well. And Greenfield forages for goods that we, well, figure we have to buy from a store. So I have not bought toilet paper in over five years, and I currently grow my own toilet paper, and this is softer than anything you can buy at the store. It... Interesting. Rob Greenfield uses leaves. The bears in that TV commercial use Charmin. That's this week's Eagle News. Join us next week for stories that matter to you. Visit our websites at eaglenews.net and eaglenewslive.com. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash eaglenews and on Facebook at facebook.com slash eaglenews. Thank you for watching. I'm Thomas I. Leitness. I'm one with 25.